This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Firstly, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The Asma'ullah al-Husna or the names of Allah Azza wa Jal we are doing Huwa Allahu al-Ladhi la ilaha illa hu If you are trying to remember it, it's good if you remember it along the every week that we are doing it because every week we are covering about maybe four names maximum three names four names so it makes it easy for you to uh, to to continue uh, and and to memorize that along alongside myself and others who are memorizing it so huwa allah alladhi la ilaha illa hu ar rahman ar rahim al malik al quddus al salam al mu'min al muhaimin al aziz al jabbar al mutakabbir الخالق البارئ المصور الغفار القهار الوهاب الرزاق الفتاح العليم القابض القابض الباسط الخافض الرافع المعز المذل السميع البصير and inshallah we will try and do today the last few names that I've said الخافض الرافع المعز المذل and if you get beyond that then we'll do السميع البصير now the name al khafid of Allah Azza wa Jal, it is a name that Allah Azza wa Jal has used for himself and he has also used it, used it in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, describing the events of uh, the, the catastrophical site of the Day of Judgment, what the Day of Judgment itself will do. So Allah Azza wa Jal here said, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ When the great occurrence of the Waqi'ah, the thing that will happen, the thing that will strike, the thing that will become catastrophe, that will take place. And the thing that's taking place will take place. That is what, that is the day of judgment. And the day of judgment basically will come. إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَ لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا كَاذِبًا Its occurrence has no doubt whatsoever. There's no lies about its occurrence. خَافِضَةُ rafia. Now here Allah has used the word khafida, which means that the day of judgment itself will be something that will bring people down. It will bring jinns down. It will take their dignity away. It will take their pride away. It will make them feel low. It will take away from them the izzah, the dignity that they had in this world. Rafia, but the day of judgment itself will be something when that occurrence comes, many people will be lifted. Those who are low will be lifted. Those who didn't have dignity will be given dignity. Those who are not regarded to be high will be high on the day of judgment. So khafidatul rafi'ah. Now who are the, who, what will the Day of Judgment do? The Day of Judgment in terms of the people who disbelieved in Allah and the people who went away sinning, then they will be from the Ashab shimal They will be from the people of the left side. And the people of the left side, Allah Azza wa has given, in that surah, if you look in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, you will see that Allah Azza wa He has described many torments that He has placed for them, in, including the um, Samum, Hamim, boiling water, uh, hot, hot sort of air, and um, smoke that will keep them, uh, you know, burning inside hellfire. So this this is khafida. This is the day of judgment that will put them low, and rafia is that which will take them up. So it will be people who were in this world who didn't have the benefits of always being in the best of their fortunes. But Allah Azza wa Jalla has said many, many, many different benefits. He has said that he will give them, he will make them ashabul yameen, he will make them from, from the people of the right side. Or he has said, as-sabiqun, as-sabiqun, the first of the first in the day of judgment. And on that Allah Azza wa Jalla has said that they will have aqwab, they will have many cups of drinks that will be served to them, many different servants that will come to them, they will be reclining on cushions, they will have uh, many different varieties of food, including the food of the, of the birds that will come right in front of them, roasted and so on. So many different gifts Allah has counted. Rafi'ah. This is when the Day of Judgment will lift these people up. 
So these people on the Day of Judgment, those of them who have had might, when they go into the hellfire, Allah Azza wa Jal, according to Surah Duhan, will say, Zuk innaka anta al-azizul kareem. Now taste this. Taste this punishment. Why? Because you were a person in the world who was mighty. You were a person who was mighty, who was strong, who was noble, who thought you had all this power to yourself. You thought it, it was your own power. So now you taste. Taste this punishment. Allah will say that to punish them and to give them severe on top of the severe punishment, to give them a mental torment. A mental torment, which is, like, now look, taste this. You think you were, you were great? Well, how great are you right now? That's the uh, end of this person. As for the other person who Allah has lifted, that person, Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah has said in the Holy Quran, for example, with, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has said, وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ We have lifted your mention, your praise. We have lifted your mention or your praise. So what that means is that Allah has given Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a high place where he's always going to be mentioned. Now, look at the, look at the fact that Allah has lifted him or mentioned him. The fact is that we are mentioning after Allah's name, we are mentioning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa name. After Allah's name, we are mentioning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa name. So, ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad abdu rasulu. So we are saying Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa name after Allah's name. We have to say it every time in the shahada. Every Muslim who prays is compulsory for him or for her to say it in the shahada. So this is how Allah Azza wa has given him a high status. Not only in this world He has given him a high status, in the next world Allah will give him a high rank as well. And that is Ad-Darajat Rafi'ah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa one of the things he will get is on the Day of Judgment, he will get the rank of standing in front of Allah and beseeching on behalf of all the human beings. And interceding on behalf of all the people who want uh, to go to, you know, who want their accounts to start. So that is Allah saying, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ We have lifted your remembrance. But when saying that in Surah Al-Alam Nashrah, Allah said, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ Allah said, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى If anyone wants to be lifted and Allah lifts their name, and Allah gives them a high rank, then they will have to go through some form of difficulty, after which will come ease. So there's difficulty and there's ease. So whoever's name is lifted, Whoever Allah will raise up, Allah Azza wa Jal will want them to make some form of sacrifice wherever they can, and then Allah Azza wa Jal will then lift them. With every sacrifice comes an upliftment. And <coughs> just as in a hadith of Muslim, Muslim it says, In Allah yarfa' bihaad al Quran aqwama. With this Quran, through this Quran, Allah will raise so many people. He will raise their status. And through this Quran, Allah will. Put down. The word we use there is yada'u. Allah will put down so many people. So just, you know, I just want to make a little mention <coughs> that what is happening around the world right now. Do you think that in any way that it is, it is um, having an effect on our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa name? It's not. It's not breaking him down at all. Because the more they try to vilify the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the more they try to criticize him, the more people who never knew of him or who knew of him, who didn't want to research him, will now go and research him. The more people will, will go and they will start to at least mention Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At least they will mention Muhammad. They will say, who is this man Muhammad? <coughs> Allah is giving them an excuse to come and to start investigating. And what we people should do is that this is the time to say to them, talk about the good things about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Talk about the good things. Spread them. Allah Azza wa Jal, in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He sent him many enemies that tried to bring him down. Many enemies were there. They were naturally created enemies who hated, hated Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They hated him, they hated him right in front of his face. Forget after dying 1400 years later, they hated him on his face. And they showed their hatred through their poetry, through their insults, through their remarks, through the ways that they tried to attack him. And when they did that, when it was the insults that they sent to Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what did he do? He said, oh Hassan bin Thabit, his name is Hassan bin Thabit. Hassan, get up and start to say, start to give some poetry against the poetry that they've given. But to Hassan, he said what? He said, just mention my praise. To Hassan, he wanted him to mention his praise. So Hassan bin Thabit was making all this poetry 
And he wasn't saying poetry to prove the Prophet is true, no. He was saying poetry to say how bad the comments of the kuffar were, no. He just started to praise the Prophet just praise him. And Rasulullah even said, he said, oh Allah, help Hassan through Jibreel. Send Jibreel to Hassan and make him say these words. Automatically come out of his mouth to praise me. So that's what Rasulullah did. And what happens 1400 years later? We've forgotten today, we've forgotten. In fact, nowhere in the mention of the seerah will you find the, the vilifying, the lowly comments that were said about our Prophet wasallam in his time. They've been forgotten. Why? Because people never passed them on. The Muslims said, we're going to ignore them. The Muslims said, let's ignore the poetry of the Kufa. Let's concentrate on the poetry of the Muslims. Let's concentrate on the poetry of the Mus- Muslims and the poetry about the Prophet So they spread, they continue to spread the goodness about the Prophet They spread the good news and the good poetry and the good words about the Prophet They spread his ahadith, they spread his wisdom, they talked about his character. They, they continue to follow the Prophet Over a couple of centuries, maybe even a century, all these enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, whatever they created was gone in history. We don't even know half their names. Whoever made this history, we don't even know half their names. But we know Hassan bin Thabit, his poetry is recorded till today. You go to Sirah ibn Hisham, you will find pages and pages and pages full of his poetry in the love of the Prophet ﷺ. So why am I saying this? It's because today, the way to attack all of this is, on the internet, on YouTube and on other things, spread the good word. Just carry on saying good things about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Spread his ahadith, spread his character, say how he is. Instead of talking about the, about the film, instead of talking about the negativity, instead of talking about what people have tried to say as an insult to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you just carry on talking about good. Because good, in the end, will prevail. And the people who are, will get, you know, there'll be a lot of people who catch on to the good. And they'll say, is it true? Can it be true that I heard Muhammad was this and was that and was that? And now this Muslim tells me he's Muhammad, his prophet is this, is that. Let me go and investigate. And the day they come to investigate, many of them will come and walk into this deen. That's it. If you carry on talking about the negative, no, no, my prophet wasn't like this, my prophet wasn't like that, my prophet wasn't like that. What have you given them? What is your prophet then? What have you given them? What are they supposed to take away and to take for themselves and to look inside Sahih al-Bukhari? Which parts of Sahih al-Bukhari should they look at? All, in, all, all available on the internet. The Quran is available on the internet. Everything is available on the internet now. And they can go and they can investigate. So, Allah Azza wa Jal, yarfa'u. Allah will lift through this Quran many people. And He has done that over time. Allah has lifted. And through this Quran, Allah will lower. He will drop down. He will bring down what many different nations. And Allah has done that. And Allah has shown us how all these people, all these people who are trying to take down the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the more they try to take it down, the more Allah raises it. The more they try to take it down, the more Allah raises it. Allah is the one who's going to give him dignity. What is it to you and me to try and, you know, shame or anyone else in the world to try and shame a man whom Allah, the Creator has said, I'm going to lift his name. وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرًا and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's gone through his usr, he's gone through his days of hardship. Now it's yusr, now it's ease. Inna ma'al usri yusra, with the hardship is, I'm going to give you ease. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرَغَبْ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told to turn to Allah. To turn to Allah. Anyway, so Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu narrates his hadith that this Qur'an will be the source of many people going astray. And this Qur'an will be the source that many people will be lifted. مَنْ تَوَاضَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ There's a hadith in Muslim. That whosoever is humble for the sake of Allah, Allah will lift him. Allah will give him a higher, higher you know, a rank in this world. And in the next world. But whosoever... Man takabbara, whosoever will be arrogant, wada'ahu Allah. Allah will put him down. Allah will bring him down. So, another, another way of looking at this is that Allah Azza wa Jal, He holds the key to giving whoever He wants. The chance to be raised or the chance to be dropped. And one part of Surah Al-Mujadala in the, 20, in the 58th Surah says, 
that yarfa'illahu alladhina amanu minkum walladhina utul ilma darajat Allah azza wa jalla what he will do is those who believe and those who have been given knowledge so you believe and you also seek knowledge those people Allah said yarfa'il Allah will then lift them Allah will give them a higher status higher rank darajat many different many different ranks why because in the beginning of the ayah, if you see, those people were humble for the sake of Allah. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, O you who believe. Ida qila lakum tafassahu. When it's said to you, make space in a gathering. You know when Muslims come to a gathering? Anytime you see a person who wants to come, who wants to join us in, join, join in with us, we're supposed to make space for them. This is one of the basic adabs, basic etiquettes of the Qur'an and of, of the Muslims. So Allah said, Oh, who you who believe? When it's said to you, Tafassahu fil majalis. When it's said to you, make space in the gathering, make space. Wa shuzu, fan shuzu. Now, if in the gathering you are told, get up, please, and move over to that side, or whatever, in a gathering, and you do it out of your humbleness, you do it because you want to, you want to give, allow somebody else some space. Yarfa, that's when Allah says He will lift. He will lift your status. He will lift the status of those people who are humble. For those people who are close to Allah. Now in saying this, what we need to understand is, I need to be the one who needs to do amal and practice on this. So any gathering that we go to, we have to be bare the etiquettes and the, and the, um, the, the etiquettes of that gathering. And how to make ease for people and not how to make difficulty for people. And if we do that, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, يَرْفَعُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Allah will raise your status. Allah will raise your status, not only that, but then the ilm and the knowledge has also been said that with your iman, Allah will give you ilm. And they say that in the, in the circles of knowledge, in the circles of knowledge, first comes adab, first comes respect, and then after that comes knowledge. First comes the etiquettes, and then after that comes the person proceeding in the, in the religion to try and gain something. Because without the etiquette and without the respect, having of people, a person is, has got no weight in the sight of Allah Azza wa So respect is something that we all need to have for all the different gatherings that we got, especially the ones we have believers inside, we need to respect one another, and that's how Allah will raise that status. So his name is again, al khafir the one who lowers, and al rafir the one who will lift. And then the next name is al muiz and then it's al mudil Al Mu'iz and Al Mudil. These are two names of Allah Azza wa Jalla. He has used in the Holy Quran in Surah Al Imran, third Surah, Ayah number twenty-six. You will find there Allah says, "Qul Illahumma Malik Al Mulk Tuti Al Mulk Man Tasha Wa Tanzi Al Mulk Man Tasha Wa Tuizzu Tuizzu Man Tasha Wa Tuzillu Man Tasha." Qul say, "Allahumma O Allah, Malik Al Mulk, the one who has, the one who owns all the sovereignty." Tu'til mulk, you will give your sovereignty to whoever you want. But tanzi'ul mulk, and you will seize it, and snatch it away from whoever you want. And take it away. Wa tu'izzu man tasha, and you will give dignity to whoever you want. Wa tu'zillu man tasha, you will disgrace whoever you want. Now, mu'iz means the one who gives dignity, and mudil means the one who disgraces. Now again here, <coughs> these two names, al-mu'iz and al-mudil, we place our iman in Allah Azza wa Jal that Allah is the one that is the source of our dignity. Anyone who wants any form of dignity, it only lies with Allah, not with anyone else. And the interesting thing here is that Allah Azza wa Jal, when He has said Al Mu'iz Al Mudil, especially when He has used the we use Izza in the Quran. Izza means dignity. When he has used Izza in the Quran, you will always find it in a place where there's the real believers being mentioned and the munafiqeen, the hypocrites are being mentioned. For example, if you look, look in Surah al munafiqun 63rd Surah of the Quran, Surah al munafiqun There you will find Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ Real dignity, real true dignity belongs to who? Belongs to Allah. 
belongs to the messenger, belongs to the believers. But the hypocrites have no way of comprehending this, no way of truly understanding this. So real izza, real dignity is to Allah. What that means is that there was an incident <coughs> where the leader of the hypocrites in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, the leader of the hypocrites was one that was always obviously dead against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it comes to a time when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is coming back from a particular battle. And that leader of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, he made a statement. And you will find this all in the tafsir in Surah Al-Munafiqeen if you look at it. He said, when we go into Medina back again, if you go back to Medina, لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْ هَلْ أَذَلْ the most pe- the people with the most dignity, most dignified people, will take away, will throw away, and throw out, and exile the lowest amongst us, the ones who have no dignity. And this hypocrite was saying that when he goes back to Medina, he said he was referring to himself as the most dignified, and he was referring to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam billah as the as most disgraced. And he said when he gets into when he gets into Medina, he's going to take out and throw out Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from Medina. Now look at what happens. The person who says it has made a threat. This news came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and it spread among the Muslims. So the leader of the hypocrites has made this statement. So they come all the way to Medina and what do, the, when the leader of the hypocrites he comes to Medina, his own son, Abdullah, his own son, is standing at the gates of Medina, at the part where you have to enter Medina, and he's standing with a sword in his hand. This leader of the hypocrite, his own son, who's a Muslim. So he's waiting for his dad to come. And his dad comes. So when his dad comes, his dad's on a horse, or a camel, is trying to enter Medina. And his son standing with a sword. So if his dad goes right, his son goes right. Dad goes left, his son goes left. And he says, there's no way you're going to come in. Until you repent what you said. <laughs> Until you take back what you said. Now the, re- the, the news comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That Abdullah is preventing his own father from coming to Medina. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sent a message to Abdullah that let him come in let him come in now Abdullah was enraged and but because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he sent a message that let your father in Abdullah had to let him in so he said that he said you're lucky today he said if you if, if Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam hadn't told me to let you in this sword, you step one step forward, this sword would have sorted you out. I would have showed you today who is the most disgraced amongst all of us. I don't care, you're my father. I would have actually done it to you because you made such an insulting remark to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, being rahmatul alamin, being the mercy to mankind, he said, no, that's not the way to deal with matters. He said, let him in. Now, Allah azza wa jal then sent these verses down and said what? Allah Azza wa Jal sent the verses down and said that He said, La yukhrijan al azu min hal adal. He's gonna take the most disgraced and referring to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and referring to the believers, he's going to come in and he's gonna throw all of them out. Then Allah said, Walillahi la He didn't realize because he's a munafiq and a hypocrite, he doesn't realize that true dignity belongs to me. I will give dignity to whoever I want. Now when Allah wants to give dignity to someone, subhanallah al-azim, and when He wants to give you power, all you have to do is walk in, in front of your enemies, and your enemies will just fear you. This, this fear, you know this fear in the heart? Where does it come from? Allah said, Allah said in the Holy Quran, that Allah is the one that drops fear into the heart. 
Allah puts fear into the heart. So the enemy, how much he will fear you, <laughs> is up to Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, Allah has given me five things that he never gave any other messenger. Five things, he never gave any other messenger. One of those things, this is a hadith in Muslim. One of those things he gave is, he made Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so fear, so, so, uh, so feared, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, from a month's distance away, one month's traveling distance away. Now this is, if you want to calculate in terms of actual how much this is, in three days they used to travel about approximately 50 miles. So if you times that by 10, it's approximately 500 miles. Okay? So that's 30 days traveling, one month traveling. 500 miles away approximately, if Rasulullah's enemies are there that far, they will fear the Prophet They will fear him from that far, far away. And they, they tried, they tried a lot of, you know, a lot of ways they tried to get to the Prophet and to cause him fear. I mean, there's that famous hadith, where Rasulullah sallallahu is, you know, it's a hadith in Bukhari. They, they come to a, um, a place, you know, they, they're, moving, they're moving because they're, they're traveling uh, as an army, and they come to rest. And they say that we, we came to a thicket of trees, and we all started to take bags down, and start to, start to look for space to rest. And we, we left a massive, nice tree, that has a good, had good shade, we left that for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he came and he rested under that tree and all the other believers, they rested under different, different trees. But they left that best tree, the most shady tree for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And Rasulullah sallallahu before he slept, he took his, his sword out, he hung the sword onto a branch and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa goes to sleep. And then one of the enemies, he must have had a lot of guts. He came and he saw all these Muslims are sleeping. They're taking a rest. So this enemy came tiptoeing all the way, walked over the believers. And in the end, he saw right in the middle, there is their leader, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There is their leader. Now he said to himself, if I kill him, if I kill him, khalas. That's it, that's the Muslims are finished. So he comes all the way up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is still sleeping. He takes the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And he points it at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Now the Arabs had one thing is that they wouldn't kill a man in his sleep. They would wake him up. So when he's, wake, when he's woken up, then they would kill him. So now they, what he did is he woke the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, he said, hey! And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lying down. Hey, man yam na'uka minni. He said, who's going to save you from me? So Prophet also woke up, he saw this man, enemy of his, he's got Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's got it right pointing towards him. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he slowly got up. When he got up on his feet, he said, Allah. Now when he said Allah like that, the enemy feared, he dropped the sword, with that, with that terror, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa picked their sword up, and then he pointed it towards his enemy, and he said, who's going to save you from me now? And Rasulullah sallallahu said, Allah, that, just saying Allah, made that enemy fear so much, he dropped the sword. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he's got the sword now. Now by saying this so loudly, obviously his whole companions, they woke up as well. So they all gathered around, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And now these enemy sees that <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is going to kill him. So he says, he says, please take the best of your two choices. Make the best choice. Meaning you can let me off, you can kill me, you can let me off. But he's saying, please let me off. So he prom- Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, if I let you off, what are you going to promise me? 
So he said, if you let me off, I promise that I will not come and I will not fight with another nation that will fight with you against you. I will not join them. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said, "Okay, meaning that I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna, you know, if there's a if there's a whole army coming to fight you, I'll never join any army that's coming to fight you." So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said, "Okay," he said he said to his companions, "said let him go, let him go." So the thing is here, the the fear that Allah puts into their enemy's heart. Or the tact, the tactful ways that Allah gives, it's through Allah. For example, the the uh, battle of trenches is coming, and the Muslims are baffled. How are they going to save themselves from ten thousand of an army? Allah wants to save them. Allah wants to give them dignity. Allah wants to save them. So what does Allah do? Just before that, Allah sent Salman al Farsi as a Muslim. So Salman came as a Muslim. And he was in that consultation of the Prophet ﷺ. When he was asking the Muslims, what should we do? And Salman said, O oh Prophet, when we, get, when we have people attacking us in a large number and we can't defend ourselves, we dig a trench. Make a, such a large trench, such a large hole in the ground, a pit in the ground, that our enemies can't cross over. So Rasulullah ﷺ then accepted his advice. And then he made a trench all the way around three parts of Medina. Now who gave that idea at that moment when Rasulullah needed it? It was Allah, Allah Azza wa to give the ideas, to, to cast the fear into the enemies. It is Allah Azza wa Allah said in the Holy Quran, when they were fighting in the battle of Badr, He said that, I am the one, Alqayna fi qulubihimu ru'm, sanulqi fi qulubihimu ru'm. I am the one, I will cast fear into their hearts. I will cast that fear into their hearts. That is Allah when He wants to give you izza, when He wants to give you dignity. Now Allah has said in the Holy Quran that for the believers is the dignity. Now what does that mean? That means that today, unfortunately, our belief, our own belief is not that strong. And because our belief is not that strong, the izza or the dignity we're supposed to get, Allah Azza wa hasn't given it to us because of the fact that we haven't we haven't earned it ourselves by becoming good believers. Once we become good believers, it will be simple. Allah Azza wa will, give, will give us the, the dignity that we, that we need. So, the next thing after this to understand is, Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us to seek that dignity through Him, not through any other person, whether Muslim, non-Muslim, hypocrite, anyone who's got any power, there's no power with anyone. Imagine a person who's got a lot of wealth. Imagine there are a lot of people around here. They've got a lot of wealth. They've got houses. They've got some of them own, own large part of countries. These are tycoons who own large, large you know, places out there. Allah Azza wa has made it very clear to us that we don't seek izzah through that. Our dignity is in life through that. And that's something which Rasulullah wasallam taught the Muslims and, and his Sahaba, and they understood this. For example, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he's been asked now to go to Palestine. And in Palestine, when they first took over Palestine, or when they came to take over Palestine, the, the Christians there, they said that our books say, look, we're not going to fight you. But our books say that your, your leader will come to us and he will have certain signs. If he has these signs, then we will basically give you automatically free, we will give you the keys of, of Palestine. We'll give you the keys of Palestine. You can run you can rule this whole place. But we need you to, to see the signs of your leader. So the Muslims said, who do you want to see? They said we want to see your leader. Your leader will have the signs. So they said, okay, our leader is coming. So what they did is Khalid bin Walid, <coughs> radiallahu anhu, Khalid bin Walid was one of the best warriors at the time. So they said, Khalid, they said, cover your face. And Khalid, wear some extra clothing. Yeah? Make yourself look big. Slightly, slightly bigger than his stature. His stature was slightly smaller than Sayyidina Umar. He said, they said, wear, wear some extra clothing, cover your face, and come in front of these people. And act like Umar radiallahu anhu. 
and we'll make you sound like, you know, because he was the leader of the army. He said, we'll make you sound like, you, you are our leader. So Khalid bin Walid, he came, and he came covering his face, and he came and he was, he was moving, you know, uh, swelling his sword around on his horse and so on. And these Christians, they saw him, they observed him, and they said, no, they said, if this is your leader, if this is the leader of all the believers, you fight us as long as you want. You won't be able to defeat us. Because our books don't describe this man as the one who is the leader who, t- who, who has to come and therefore we give the keys. So what then happens is, they said, okay, fine, this is the leader of our army, he's not the leader of, our, of the entire believers. If you want the leader of the entire believers, then we'll have to ask him to come. Now Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu was, a, was an individual that... <clears throat> Sayyidina Umar was an individual that didn't want to leave Medina. Why he didn't want to leave Medina was because he was always asking for shahada, he was asking to become a martyr inside Medina. So he hardly left Medina. Now the letter came to him that if O oh, you Amirul Mu'mineen, if you do not come at this time to Palestine, these people have said to us, Unless they see you, they're not, gonna, they're not going to decide whether to hand over the keys without a fight. So Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he agreed that he's going, to, he's going to now come and he's going to visit Palestine. So as he's now getting ready to come out of Medina, his servant gives him a very nice clothing. Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, he wears it. And he wants to leave Medina, but then he stops. He said, no. Because his khadim and all the Muslims said, look, you know, you're going to Palestine, you're going to the place where all the, all the, these were the, the heart of where the non-Muslims ruled, the Roman Empire had its heart there. How are you going to go all the way there in the, in the normal clothes that you wear? Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, when he wore his new clothing, that they gave him, nice clothing, he stopped and he said, no. He said, Allah never gave us dignity through these clothing. When Allah gave us dignity and He made us Muslims who had dignity, He never gave us through these clothing. So He went back in and He changed it to His normal clothing. His normal clothing was thick and it was, it was almost like, uh, you could imagine, you know, the, the, uh, it was quite coarse and hard. You know, like the... Uh, a sack of rice, you know, the, you know, the sack, what is made of the brown sort of material that is coarse. Not that coarse, but something that you can wear quite thick and that, that type of material. These are the things that Sayyidina Ibn al-Khattab used to wear. So Sayyidina Ibn al-Khattab wore that. Then he went with his khadim, he went with his servant. And his servant, now imagine if one of us was a leader of all the believers, what would you do? You can't get yourself a nice comfortable way of going there and all that. Yeah, Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, he had one camel between him and his servant. So when his servant used to ride it, Sayyidina Umar used to walk. And after a while, he used to put his servant down and Sayyidina Umar used to walk. Right? So they used to take turns. Right? One riding and the one getting off. One riding, one getting off. He didn't want to take two. He could have easily taken two. He had the whole Baytul Mal in front of him. The whole treasury was his. But he said, no, he's going to take his own one. So he, he traveled like this all the way till Palestine. And when he came to Palestine, and he came to the, to, uh, to, to the place where the Christians were waiting for him, he came all the way up to them. The Christian leader came out. And he said, let me observe you. So he looked at Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab. First, first they saw him coming and they got a bit of a shock. Because what happened is when they actually came to Palestine, the, it was the time of, you know, they were taking turns on the camel. You had, the, it was a servant's turn to be on the camel. And Sayyidina Umar was walking. So he's work, walking and his servant is on the camel. So his servant said, he said, Master, he said, please, we're now entering the city, so it's best if you get on the camel and I walk. He said, no. He said, that wouldn't be justice. So justice is that until we get to the end of our journey, you know, we both keep the same timing. So when I've done my, had my part, then you have your part. So they came all the way, and, they, and when they came to Palestine, the Christians were shocked. 
because they saw the, the servant on top of the camel. And they said, what? He said, that, that's your leader? And the Muslim said, no, 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 no. The one that's walking is our leader. So then Sayyidina Allah ibn Khattab came and they observed him. So they went all around him and they observed him properly, nicely observed him all around. They said, if you're the leader of the believers, you can fight us as long as you want. You will never be able to defeat us. Because our sign, our books don't give you the exact description of what you are. And he said, what? What is it? So they said that the leader of the people who will come and take over Palestine, our book says that he will have 17 patches on his clothes. But you've only got 16. 17 patches. You know, Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, every time his, his thing torn, was torn, he used to put a patch over it and he used to sew it himself. Right? So he had 16 patches all over his clothing and they counted all 16. They said, you can't be the one. So then Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, he said, here's the 17th one. He lifted his arm and he said, here's the 17th one under his armpit. <laughs> so they saw the 17th one, they said, fine. Here's the keys to a whole city. To this whole fortress. It is yours now. And that's how the Muslims came and they took over. Now Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he sits to, to eat with the, the Christians and the Muslims are sitting together. And as they're eating, something drops from the hand of Sayyidina Umar onto the ground. Not on the plate, onto the ground. So Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab goes to pick that thing up. And his companion next to his his companion next to him, he says, he said, Oh Umar, it would be good for you if you didn't pick that up in front of all these, you know, Christians that we've got in front of us. It's good if you don't pick it up. Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab picked it up, he wiped off the dirt from it. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. He wiped the dirt from it. And he said, What? Am I going to, he said loudly, he said, Am I going to leave the sunnah of my Prophet because these people are watching me? Am I going to leave the sunnah? And he ate it. Now this is, brothers, this is a, these are the real believers whom Allah gave izzah, whom Allah gave dignity. Today, you know, our people, they go, they meet the big dignitaries, as soon as they see them, they're already shaking. Muslims are already shaking. Muslims are changing their clothing for them. Yes or no? Muslims are changing the clothing for them. Muslims are changing the style for them. Muslims are Muslims have become just like them. You go to these Arab countries, half of them, even the Asian countries. You go to them, they will have alcohol served because the Western people are coming in their palaces. They've got alcohol. They've got alcohol, and it's widely widely available in their in their palaces. These are the kings. These are the royals of our royal countries who rule the Muslim countries. So they've got alcohol that will serve them. Why? Because they want to be like them. They've got women that are dressed like them. They will want their women for themselves. They will, you know, just like their women are dressed, they want their women to dress. Lowering themselves down to whatever they, they see. And forget picking up something from the floor and showing the sunnah of the Prophet and wiping and eating it. These people are saying, you know, Yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir. The Muslims are saying, you know, you Westerners, you tell us. Tell us when to dance, we'll dance. You tell us to cry, we'll cry. You tell us to laugh, we'll laugh. You know, you, <laughs> it's, become a, it's become a joke. So you think what Allah is going to give us dignity through these people or through the people who are even on the common. I'm not just having to go at the people who are leading. How many common people do you know? They go, they go to, for interviews, they go for works and jobs and so on. And just because they're in front of the non-Muslim... The sunnah and the deen goes. So a woman comes with a hand to shake them, they'll shake their hand. If the woman was to come and hug them, they'll hug the woman as well. It's my job, you're not going to get my, keep my job. They wouldn't care. Want to get my salary at the end of the day. You know, salah comes, uh, it's okay, I'll join my salah, I'll do this, I'll do that. Juma comes, if I can't go, I'll go. If not, my job, my job. This is dignity, this is, the, this is how we have put dignity to ourselves that we're going to keep for ourselves. The early Muslims, subhanAllah and Azim, they understood that dignity is only in following Allah and His Messenger. And this is something that we need to dig into our hearts. That unless we dig into our hearts, and we anchor it into our hearts, 
we cannot understand the, the truth of this ayah when Allah said, "Ala inna al-'izzat lillahi jamia." Only dignity, beware and remember that dignity and all dignity is belongs to Allah alone. Ayabtaguna inna hum al-'izzat. Are you looking for dignity in the in the face of these people, in front of them? فَإِنَّ الْعِزَّةَ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا Allah said, why are you looking for dignity other than Allah? Because all dignity is mine. Who gave them dignity? Allah gave them dignity. Allah gave them dignity. Allah will give them, give whoever He wants. And this is تُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءً you will, you will give dignity to who, who you want to. And تُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءً You will lower down whoever you want to and you will disgrace whoever you want to. Now, in the Qur'an, Allah, Allah has given us many different examples of many different nations. That either he has given them dignity or he has lowered them down. But one thing that we understand is that Allah Azza wa Jal, He looks at the aqibah. Aqibah. This is very important for us to understand, brothers and sisters. Aqibah means the last of things. When you want to measure Allah's dignity, you don't measure Allah's dignity with what is there today. If we did that, then who's the most dignified people in the world? It's these superpowers across the world. It's these people who've got the money and the wealth and the freedom and the, and the lands and all of that. These are the people and they've robbed their worlds of their riches. These are the people with dignity. You will say they are the ones who've got dignity. No, that's not what we do. Allah said, وَلِلَّهِ عَاقِبَةُ umur." Allah has the final, He has the power and the qudra, He has the control over the final part of all matters, of all issues. So you don't look at what's there today. If you, wanna, if you want to calculate who's dignified, who's not dignified, you can't calculate it by looking at the people today. Because by looking at the people today, you're only seeing one part of history. You're only seeing one part of history. You're not seeing the rest of the, rest of the future. Allah knows the future. And He knows eventually who's going to be the one who will have the last final dignity. These are the people of dignity. For example, today, I might be lowly. Today, I might not have a good house. I might not be, you know, that intelligent, that super, that whatever you want to say to it. I might be like Bilal radiallahu anhu. What did Bilal have? Bilal had nothing. He was a slave, he was freed, he stayed in the service of the Prophet sallallahu He never, He never became a businessman, never became one of the intelligence of his time, never became one of the superheroes, nothing. The only thing we know Bilal for is his adhan. He had a beautiful voice, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made him his muadhi. It's fine. That's all we know. But Bilal was mocked by so many people. They looked at him and they commented about his skin color. So many people commented throughout his life. Some lashed him and so on. But Bilal radiallahu anhu will be one of the most dignified people on the Day of Judgment. Why? Because you've got to look at Bilal's end. You don't look at Bilal's present in the world or what he was in the world. If you take the, like that any moment of history, you will see what? You will see only small little strands. Yusuf alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam. If you just concentrate on the moment that he's in the prison, Yusuf alayhi salam, when he's in the prison, you concentrate on that, you will say, oh no, this man is disgraced. This man is disgraced. If you don't see the future. But if you see the future, you will say, no, Allahu Akbar. Allah has given Yusuf alayhi salam a great dignity. He made him the king of the whole of Egypt. And if you don't see that, you will not see the, you will not see how Allah plays. When we say Allah's dignity, it's with the end. Now the other thing is that I might be a true believer and I might have my good belief and all of that. But Allah will give His dignity to a lot of the believers when He wants. It doesn't mean that just because I never received my dignity that, the, that you know, I've been failed. No. Allah will choose His time when enough believers will become true believers and they will have their, their iman founded in their heart. Allah Azza wa Jal will then give all of them dignity together. Whoever, whenever that time is. So I shouldn't feel just because in this time I've got good belief and I'm always doing my good things. But I don't see the izzah and the dignity Allah gives me in front of you know, the whole of the world. No, no, no. It's up to Allah when He wants to and He will give it to all the believers, to a group of believers, whoever He gives to at one time. وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةِ To Allah belongs all dignity. وَلِرَسُولِهِ And the Messenger. And to all the, all the believers, Allah, the Messenger and all the believers, they have the dignity. But the munafiqeen, they don't comprehend. And by saying that, if I can't comprehend what true dignity is, then I don't fall under the believers, I fall on the other side, which is the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. 
May Allah save me, may Allah save you. Mu'iz al Mudil, we've got the name of Mudil. And next week we will do Al Samir, Al Basir, Al Hakam, Al Adl. And inshallah we will, we will move on from the Jazakallah Khair. Wa akhidawan alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. ذكر علم ونور الحاملات سنا ونور والرسمات هنا سرور يا حلوات الكاسنين